I have good news. Well, at least it's good news for me. I don't know if it's good news for anyone else. Uh, it usually takes about two or three days for me to deal with my jet lag, and I feel like I'm finally dealing with my jet lag. So that's good news for me. Uh, I just want to give thanks to God this morning uh, for not only another day of life, but one more opportunity to fellowship with you here in this beautiful church, here on this beautiful campus of the Adventist University of the Philippines. Uh, it is one of my honors and privileges as a result of the job that I have to visit many colleges, universities, and seminaries in our Adventist system. And there are two things that I enjoy about such visits. One, I like meeting with students and just having conversations with them. And a few of you I've been able to speak with so far, uh, but for these few days that are remaining over this, uh, uh, during the remainder of this week, I hope to meet more of you. And one of the conversations that I enjoy having is, what brought you to this school? Regardless of where the school is, I'm always curious to know, what is it that brought you here? Why this school? And invariably, someone will say to me, I was praying and God led me through a series of events to come to whatever the school is that they are attending. That's one of the things that I enjoy about these visits such as this, to see how God is working in the lives of young men and women just as you are. Another one of the things that I enjoy about coming to universities such as this is to hear the variety of music. Uh, not just the variety of music in different countries, but often the variety of music within the particular school, in this case, AUP. And I just, as I did on yesterday, and as I'm sure I will say every day, uh, or certainly I'll be thinking it every day, I just want you to know how incredibly blessed I have been, not only by the music, but by the spirit of prayer that is here on this campus. As you know, this quinquennium, the Adventist Church, has placed a renewed focus on revival and reformation. And it will be my joy to return back uh, to my office on next week and be able to tell my colleagues that there is truly the presence of the Holy Spirit on the campus of AUP. And I praise God for you, and I will continue to pray for you that this same Spirit will always exist here on this campus, and not just on this campus, but in your hearts. As was said in the introduction earlier this morning, and as was said at the end of the worship on yesterday afternoon, uh, on uh, starting this morning at 10.30 um, in, and I believe the location was given, I myself don't even know where the location is, but I'll find out where it is between now and 10.30. Uh, I look forward to meeting with as many of you as possible during that hour uh, that we'll spend today and tomorrow and the subsequent days. As I told Pastor Vergara on yesterday, if more time is needed, then, you know, by all means, I want to extend that amount of time. Um, if it's not, if, if 1030 to 1130 is not enough time, then perhaps we can go 10 to 1130 or something to that effect. But each day we'll let you know, you know, what the plan is for that day. I believe other instructions were given also in terms of uh, not only when to come, but some type of a format 
that will allow for uh, an orderly progression of individuals to come and go uh, while we come together. I, and I want that time together to be not just one of fellowship, but one of prayer, uh, one of sharing, uh, one of, as was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, if spiritual counsel is needed, we will pray together. If some other type of counsel is needed by God's grace, the Holy Spirit will lead us in all situations in the direction that he wants us to go. So having said all of those things, I believe it is now time for us to continue with our study of God's word. But before we do that, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Holy Father, as was said on yesterday, I say also today, I thank you, we thank you, for the prayers that have been prayed, for the songs that have been sung, for the privilege that we have to worship you. And now, Lord, as we once again open the Bible, your holy word, we ask that your Holy Spirit, who is in this very room, will speak to us, will touch our hearts, will inspire our lives, and will draw us closer to you, and will also prepare us for service to others. We pray these things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, or some other device, uh, perhaps an iPhone, perhaps an iPad or some other device, I'm inviting you to turn to our, what I will use as our scripture passage for the morning. Mark, the book of Mark chapter 5. And we'll read several verses from a very well-known story. When I begin to read, you will know the story, the beginning and the end of the story. Mark chapter 5, I begin at verse 25, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It may read differently in your hearing, but regardless of the version that you have, you'll be able to follow along. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. For many, probably most, perhaps even all of us, we find this to be a familiar story. Yet within this story, there are many subplots. There are so many unanswered questions. Mark does not address them all, but the questions are out there and they poke and they prod at our imaginations. Why could not the doctors help her? What about her family? Nothing is said about her family. What's her family situation? Let's imagine what life was like for this woman. Wherever she went, and there were not a lot of places that she could go, wherever she went, people knew that she had been there. Because of her medical condition, no matter how hard she tried, there was always the chance that she would leave 
a stain somewhere. As such, she was not able to travel to many places. She could not go to the synagogue because she was ceremonially unclean. As such, because the word was out there that she was ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, by so many people, in the minds of so many people, she was an object of scorn. She was an outcast. Because she was ceremonially unclean, she was deemed to be cursed of God. What was life like otherwise for this woman? No doubt it had to be mentally draining to have so many people think so negatively of you. To be walking along the street and then people start looking at her strangely, whispering to one another, isn't that the woman with that disease that no one seems to know anything about? She can't be cured of that disease. Let's not get too close to her because what she has may rub off on us. It had to be mentally draining. It had to be spiritually depleting because if she could not go to the synagogue, if she was not welcomed into the place of worship, then certainly God must not love her either. The people don't love me, God must not love me. Certainly that must have been a temptation, but somewhere, somehow, in the back of her mind, she summoned the courage to think otherwise. I know what others are thinking about me, but somehow, some way, I believe that God must have a different opinion about me. The word was floating through the city. There's a great rabbi who's coming. He's been teaching like no one else has ever taught. He has greater wisdom and a clear authority that is higher and greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. He's coming to town. Hope springs in the heart of this woman. Maybe this man can do something for me because I've heard that he has performed miracles for other people. The lame have been given the ability to walk. Those who can't speak, they're now able to speak. Those who are blind, they're now able to see. Maybe, just maybe, this same rabbi, this same Jesus can do something for me. In fact, I believe that if I can just get in his presence, that alone might be enough. Later in this story, for reasons that we will discuss, Jesus used her as an object lesson. For indeed, as you know and as we read, he did heal her. And this morning, as we consider the topic, the God who heals, we discover that there are lessons that we can learn, not just about God, but about this woman. So what is it that we can learn from her? The lessons are already right here in the verses that we just read. In verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. I can imagine that there in this town, in this village, all of the people who had heard all of these stories of these great miracles wanted to be around this person, wanted to be near this great rabbi. And here is this woman. She's pushing her way through the crowd. 
And as she pushes, people are looking at her all strange. Why? Move, get back, stay away from us. What you have, we might get also. She pushes her way through. Excuse me, pardon me. I need to get through the crowd. Some people, as they heard the commotion, I can imagine they just stepped back because it was in the atmosphere. They knew that she was there. Yet there were some people who were still blocking the way, blocking her view, but she knew that Jesus was over there somewhere. And in her heart, she got this close and she said, I know that if I can only touch his garments, he will heal me. She kept her eyes on Jesus. And I would suggest, as we get started here this morning, that one of the lessons that we can learn from this woman is, no matter what others say, keep your eyes on Jesus. This woman was the object of ridicule. She was the object of scorn. She was the object of contempt. Everybody talked about her. Nobody loved her. Everyone felt that she was useless to society. She heard the criticisms. She saw the looks. She knew what people were thinking. But regardless of what others said or did, she kept her eyes on Jesus. I wonder, what if she had lost her focus? She's somewhat lost in the crowd. It would have been easy to be separated from where Jesus was, but she was not going to allow this to happen. She maintained her focus, although she was in the crowd, she kept her focus, and in spite of the crowd, she kept her focus. What she understood is something that we always need to keep in mind. In order to see Jesus, we cannot focus on the crowd. In order to see the living Christ, we cannot be distracted by those who are around us. Yes, there are people around us. Yes, these people are important. But when there is a blessing to be received, the crowd must not get in the way. The focus must be on Jesus Christ. There are too many people in this world. Perhaps some of those who are distracted, uh, perhaps some of those people are right here on this campus. But there are too many people who are distracted by others. They're not looking for Jesus. They're not looking at Jesus. And please understand that the distractions are not always bad things. These people who surrounded Jesus were not bad people. They were often good people. They were actually trying to come close to Jesus in their own way. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with the distractions that we face because sometimes the distractions can actually be good things. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we're distracted by our jobs. Is there anything wrong with a job? No. A job is a good thing, but a job can nevertheless become a distraction. Classes. That's a good thing also. Would you agree with me? That's why you're here, of course. You're here to study. You're here to learn. You're here to prepare for a life of service. Classes are a good thing, but classes too can become a distraction. They become a distraction if they get in the way of seeing Jesus Christ. Other people are good things. The boyfriend is a good thing. 
The girlfriend is a good thing. Other friends are good people also. But even the boyfriend, even the girlfriend, even the husband, even the wife can become a distraction if they separate us from being able to see Jesus Christ. Too many, I say, are distracted by others, not looking for Jesus, not looking at Jesus. But we learn a critical lesson from this woman. The crowds were thick. Some people were tall. Some people were wide. Some people took up a lot of space. Some people were just rude. Some people blocked the way to see Jesus. But she did not allow others to keep her from focusing on Jesus. It did not matter what others thought. It did not matter what others said. It did not matter what others did. She had her mind set on what she wanted. She maintained her focus. My brothers and sisters, God calls us to focus on him. Not on the other things. Please understand what I'm saying. People are important. Jobs are important. School is important. But these are not the most important things. Jesus is most important. What else can we learn from this woman? We find it in verses 28 and 29. We just read those verses. If I just touch his garments, I will be made well. Immediately upon touching, she was healed. We find that in verse 29. I believe that we can also learn this lesson from this woman. We must believe that we can experience what Jesus has for us. Believe that what Jesus has for you is for you. Now, I don't know what that is. I have heard many people say what I just said, and they misapply it in so many ways. For in this world, there are many pros preachers of a prosperity gospel. And they say that when you live for Jesus, when you when you dedicate yourself to him, he will give you all of the wealth, all of the riches, all of the good things of this life. And I hate to disappoint you today, but that's not necessarily the case. That's not necessarily a biblical concept. But what is biblical today? The truth is, in the word of God, it is very clear that when we pray according to God's will, when we seek what his will is, whatever God has for us, he's going to give it to us. In the case of this woman, Jesus had a gift of healing for her. Jesus had the blessing of a fresh physical start for her. And by faith, she believed, and by faith, she accepted the gift. He doesn't need to say anything. He doesn't need to touch me. He doesn't need to do anything else. I believe that if I am just in his presence and I get close enough and I touch him, then the blessing is for me. My brothers and sisters, when we believe, that belief helps us to see and realize the will of God. This woman was scorned by others. She was cast to the side. But Jesus used her as an object lesson. Jesus used her to teach us something about him, himself, and something about us. But there's more to this story than, than this woman. Because not only are there lessons to learn about the woman and from the woman, there are lessons for us to learn about God in this story. And I 
And I pick up the rest of this story in verse 30. We did not read this earlier, but the rest of this story really tells us so much more about God. Look at verse 30. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? I believe there's several lessons that we can learn about God in this story. And the first of them is this, that Jesus Christ radiates healing power. There is power in Jesus Christ like no other power that we can experience. Jesus said, who touched me? I perceive, the King James Version says, I perceive that virtue has gone out from me. For you Greek scholars here, and I know that you're here, you learned somewhere along the line, and if you haven't learned it, you will discover that there is a word that is used here, and the tense of that word indicates something that took place in the past and the action continues into the present and the future. That's the word that Jesus used in Luke chapter 8, verse 46, when he said that this virtue, this power, had gone out from him. What Jesus was saying was simply this. The power that is inside me, Jesus says, the power that is within God Almighty has existed from time past, it continues today, and it continues to go out in the future. When this woman touched Jesus, she received eternal power. She received something that was greater than the power that you and I have. She received something that had benefits far above and beyond anything that we could ever imagine. His power is from past to present, from everlasting to everlasting. And here in the story, as it continues, his disciples, verse 31, said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? Have you ever been in a crowded situation? Maybe you've been walking. Maybe you've been on a bus. Maybe you've been on a train, a subway, somewhere of that nature. And the crowds are so thick, there's not enough room to even turn around. Have you ever been in a situation like that? There's no way that you cannot say that someone touched you because clearly there are people pressing all around you. That's what's going on with Jesus. The crowds are around him. They're bustling. They're bouncing off him. They're bouncing off one another. Jesus never said anything like this in this conversation. Jesus never said anything like this as he was moving from one point to the other. But all of a sudden, when this woman touches him, he stops. I can imagine there's a hush in the crowd. Jesus turns around. He looks and he asks the question, who touched me? What do you mean, Jesus? Who touched you? There are people all around you. Of course someone touched you. Everybody's touching you. It's crowded here. No, this was not a regular touch, Jesus said. This was a special touch. As Mrs. White, Ellen White says in the book, The Desire of Ages, that chapter is so aptly titled. This wasn't a common touch. It was the touch of faith. Today I believe that there are too many people in the crowd who are settling for a common touch. There are too many people who settle for a casual or superficial experience with Jesus. It becomes very easy for people to accept something that is very perfunctory, that is just a routine. It's very easy to get up in the morning and say a quick prayer and get started with the day. 
After all, we have a lot to do. We have classes that we need to get to. We have homework that needs to be done. We have assignments that need to be fulfilled. We have exams for which we need to study. We have so many responsibilities. And, and, and let me add that these responsibilities don't end when you graduate from AUP. I remember when I was studying for the ministry. Somehow in my mind, as I was working so hard to graduate, I said, I can't wait till I graduate. Because not only will I get to work, but I'll have more time to read the things that I want to read. I'll have more time to do the things that I want to do. School is so pressurized. There's so many things to do. But one day, I won't have to deal with all of these pressures. That's what I said when I was in university. And then guess what? I graduated, but the responsibilities did not go away. They just moved from one setting to another setting. And it was still very difficult for me to find the time to spend in prayer and study of the Word. And once I thought I had figured all of that out, okay, now I'll be able to spend more time in prayer and study of the Word. And then I got married. And now there's something else. It's a good thing, but it can be a distraction. Now I had a job. Now I had a wife. Once I adjust to life with a job, once I adjust to life with my wife, then I'll be able to spend more time in prayer and Bible study. And guess what happened next? Then the children came. First the daughter, then the son. I thought it was enough of a challenge to have one child. And just when we got accustomed to one child, then we had a second child. One day, I said, I'll be able to spend time in prayer and study of the Word the way that I want to. And guess what I finally discovered? There will never be time. But what you have to do is make the time. To be intentional about the time. That's where this woman is. Everybody else was just comfortable with just barely touching Jesus, coming close to him. It was enough for them just to be somewhere in the vicinity. But this woman wanted more than just to be in the presence of Jesus. She wanted to touch Jesus. She wanted to have a living faith experience with Jesus. And that's what made the difference. That's why Jesus was able to say, who touched me? This wasn't a common touch. This wasn't a casual touch. This wasn't an accidental touch. This was an intentional touch. She wanted to be next to Jesus. She wanted the blessing from Jesus. And that's the way it is with us. We can't just take this Bible, this book right here, and spend a few minutes reading it and saying to ourselves once we've read it, okay, I read another chapter today. Give myself a check mark. That's not how growth in Christ works. We have to spend time touching Jesus in the Word. We have to spend time like Jacob, wrestling with the angel, saying to the angel, to God himself, I will not let you go until you bless me. To touch Jesus, we have to reach past the crowds. What are those crowds? We talked about those crowds earlier. Those crowds are those things that can get in the way. 
Those crowds are the things that can distract us. Those crowds are those things that can block our view of Jesus. Nothing wrong with the crowds. The problem is when they block the view. We have to reach past the crowds. We have to reach past time to study. We have to reach past the homework. We have to reach past that boyfriend. We have to reach past that girlfriend. And, and let me say this while I'm talking about that. When it comes to that special person in your life, if that person wants more of your time, then, then, then you should be giving to Jesus Christ. If that person wants more time than you should be giving to Jesus, then that person is not for you. Jesus must always be number one. I love my wife. I love our children. But my wife and our children cannot be number one for me. Jesus has to be number one. And then my wife can be a very good number two. And then our children I won't say three and four because they have to be equal. Then our children can be 3A and 3B in this equation. But we, I cannot let the crowd get in the way. If I am to experience Jesus, I have to reach past these things and touch him. Jesus honors those who do not live to please self or others. What do we mean by that? We saw that right there again in verse 31. This woman did not care about these crowds, and I say that in a positive way. Because the crowds, remember, they did not want her to get close to them. And some of them probably didn't even want her to get close to Jesus. But in her mind, she did not care about these things. There was only one thing that mattered to her. It wasn't the people, it wasn't her circumstances, it was not any of these other things. The only thing that mattered to her was Jesus and touching Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus because she knew that Jesus was the God who could heal her. God honors faith. He honors humility. He honors all of these things. Now you may be wondering if the title of this sermon is The God Who Heals, you've only spent, you may be thinking, a little bit of time talking about the healing, uh, the, 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 the healing process itself. The story is about healing, and clearly this is the God who heals. But I want to come a little closer to home right now and talk about this concept of healing because this raises a question that we have all asked at some point in time. Perhaps this woman asked this question. I can imagine that she was a good Jewish woman. She was a conscientious Jewish woman. And every day, every night, I can imagine she got on her knees and she prayed to God, God, you see my situation. Do something about it. God, you hear my prayers. Come to my rescue. God, you see me. God, you hear me. I need you to heal me. And for 12 years, she had no answer to the question. She went to this doctor, and the doctor said, I've tried everything that I can do. You might need to try another doctor. So she went to a second doctor, and a third doctor, and on and on. She spent all of her money, the Bible says, still without healing. I can imagine that she was distressed. She was tempted, certainly tempted, to despair. But after 12 years, perhaps she learned this one lesson 
that we need to learn if we haven't already learned it. Because there are many of us who are praying the very same prayer right now. God, my mother is sick. My father is sick. I have friends who are dying. Perhaps you've been there and you're asking, God, why aren't you hearing my prayer? Verse 34 gives us part of the answer. And, 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 and we'll dissect this as we go. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I read that verse simply for this reason. We must understand that God heals in his time and for his glory. We think that prayers for healing, we often think that healing itself is about us. What we need to understand is healing ultimately does not have anything to do with us. It has to do with God. It has to do with his plans. It has to do with what brings him honor and glory. I think of two stories. Both stories are very personal to me. Just last week, I was preaching in another city in the United States, and I looked forward to this trip because not only would I see friends not only from, from many years ago, not only would I see some relatives who happened to live in that city, but on that Sabbath afternoon, after the worship service was over, I was going to go to a cemetery. Now you may be saying, what's so special about a cemetery? What's so special about this cemetery is my grandparents are buried there. My mother's parents are both lying there, each next to the other. Here's the point of the story. In 1987, the year that my wife and I married, while it was one of the happiest years of my life, it was also one of the saddest years of my life. For six months after my wife and I married, my grandmother passed away. We knew she was sick. We knew she was struggling, but we did not know how sick she actually was. And I remember praying. We all prayed. We prayed when we realized, when we finally realized how sick she actually was. We prayed, we prayed, and we prayed, Lord, Please heal our loved one. Lord, heal my grandmother. She's a wonderful person. Churches have been raised as a result of her ministry. Hundreds of people have been baptized because of the Bible studies that, she's, that she has given. Lord, she's a wonderful person. Heal her. But it didn't happen. She passed away. Oh, too young. Only while 67 may seem old to some people,